It is April the 8th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. Yes, we're back with another episode on things in the Arctic and Antarctic. And with me, as usual, is Henry. How are you doing today? I'm good. Yeah, you're busy. Good. <laughs> you busy. just told me before the show <laughs> that you're absolutely busy. And um, it's interesting. It's, it's April. Um, it is. We had a snowstorm the other day after <laughs> having 23 degrees the day before. Everything is going bonkers here. And and it's super yeah. weird. It's like the first quarter of the year is gone and it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> no. You just wake up and think, damn, where's the time gone? <laughs> it's Groundhog Day. It's Groundhog it Day for sure. <laughs> ah, anyway, oh, um, let us look into today's topic because it is something that is uh, right in front of your ex former doorstep right <laughs> you, you it, is, live, it is it is <laughs> you used to live in iceland and uh we've had the well the pleasure sort of i'm not i'm not sure is it da is, the, is the volcano in iceland any dangerous for people that live in iceland yeah, that really depends on the volcano so the current volcano not so much um, in in terms of explosivity, uh, explosivity, yeah. so it's not really it's it's an effusive eruption. It's just um, spitting out lava fountains, not too high, not too far. So because I've, I've seen people like really yes. being fairly close to it. Some some people were playing volleyball, uh, volleyball right in front of it. <laughs> um, some crazy Icelanders. Uh, so it's it's more like a it's more like a tourist attraction right now, isn't it? That's what, what Icelanders call a touristy eruption. Yes, exactly. So um, <laughs> the, the last touristy eruption was uh, Hekla in, in, in the year 2000, which right. was quite similar. So beautiful lava fountains, not big exp explosions going on. That was what's uh, dangerous in this um, eruption here is the, the gas pollution. So the gases ah, um, uh, emitted there. So if you spend the whole day uh, around the eruption site, you probably better have a, 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 a gas mask um, with see. you because that's also one of the reasons why the official authorities um, at certain points when the weather just changes, just close the site um, entirely um, I when, the, when the gases can't um, and, leave the valley. And, and you used to live in Iceland, so whatever is going on there in terms of volcanic activity, um, this is right in your ballpark. You've been, uh, <laughs> you, you know exactly what's going on there and uh, you probably still have a good good contacts there. So okay, it's tell my, us a bit more. My, it's also my kind of nerdum, so I'm, I'm really into those volcanoes. So. <laughs> it's your hobby. But exactly, so that fits perfectly. Um, I think Iceland has had very mixed feelings. So on, on one hand, people were scared because it's it's rather close to Reykjavik. It's just about 32 kilometers um, direct um, air distance. Is it, is, it, is it along the way from the airport to Reykjavik, which is this long lava field that you have to drive through? Is it close to that? Technically, yes uh, and and no. So it's um, it, it is situated in that um, yeah in, in between the uh, that route, but more in the triangle which you would draw from the airport to Reykjavik and down to Grindavik, because mm -hmm. the eruption site is closer to Grindavik, so uh, closer to the south coast of the Reykjanes Peninsula, and um, it's in in the mountains. So it's in a mountain valley in a in a higher uh, laying valley. And that makes it difficult to spot at daylight from from the road. During nighttime, you see the glow of the of the eruption. So then, from from, you can the, actually, from that road, you can see this in the yes. distance. Oh, awesome! Yeah, you can actually see it from Reykjavik. So um, that's uh, a pretty pretty awesome thing. But in the in the beginning, when the seismic activity just increased tremendously, um, people were rather scared in, in in Reykjavik, not really knowing what to expect if it's going to be a big explosive eruption, and that could actually really threaten not only Grindavik but uh, also the capital area. And you always have to keep in mind, it's like two thirds of the population of the entire country living in that area. And uh, thus also the whole industry is um, based in that area. And that makes it rather difficult. Um, but when the eruption started and people figured it's just an uh, effusive eruption, rather touristy, people just 
came down in flocks. It's really <laughs> humongous groups. And in the beginning, um, cars were just lined up on, on road. Uh, I think it's road number 43, which is going down to the Blue Lagoon. And it was just parked at the at that road. And then people started walking um, into the area. And that walk is a three and a half hours one way hike into the mountains. There is no hiking trail or anything. It's really cross country. And whoever has walked cross country in Iceland among lava fields, rocked lava fields, knows that this is everything but easy. It and so, it and it kills your shoes. I have um, it kills everything. I've, Even I've it, done this once in Ethiopia, <laughs> walking up slightly up a hill for like five hours to get to a to, to an active volcano. And uh, we were in a small group, and one of the group, um, he his pretty much his soles of his shoes came off. They just because it is it is this this lava, this frozen lava is very well. It's like glass, but worse sort of so it's it's super super sharp it, yes. it really uh, cuts off everything oh you don't that want really to depends. fall exactly that really depends on the type of lava but uh, that actually is certainly true also in Reykjanes so there, there you have that as well um so I was really surprised seeing the humongous amounts of people taking that three and a half hours um one-way hike um to see that volcanic eruption and yeah. i think there has never been any eruption in iceland that has been better documented with a hundred and fifty thousand uh drone aerials yes. and th it's it's like they, they have memes been popping up popping up recently um where they say that the eruption has ceased due to the volcano being plucked by uh crash drones by Just molten <laughs> plastic drones <laughs> because i've seen a few videos where people flew right on top of it and then lowered the drone down and yes. i was like okay when is the point when the drone propellers are going to give up and just become liquid because these are the things propellers? are hot we're talking we're talking somewhere in the range of a thousand degrees celsius or more yeah, exactly. When when uh, the, the magma is ejected, it's around 1,300 to 1,000 degrees. And yeah. uh, it starts then solidifying at around 900 degrees. But the propellers are um, the second issue. The first issue is a camera melts because it's uh, <laughs> certainly closer and it's not in motion like the propellers, right? So well, the just... propellers fan, fan cold air from above. So. <laughs> um, let me ask so, you yeah. a question. Why, why Iceland? Why is it going on there? Because we have um, a, a pretty amazing mixture of um, geological phenomena coming together. One is uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, certainly. And uh, we have a graphic for that. For, for those who are just listening on the audio podcast and on YouTube, you actually have also a chance to see the visual. We so the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge... The exactly. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is kind of... Um, um, yeah, the border between tectonic plates, and it goes far from the south, from the southern ocean at the edge of Antarctica, all the way up to the Arctic Ocean. And you have a number of plates um, meeting um, in the middle of the ocean. It starts down at the bottom with Africa and South America and the Antarctic plate. Then you have uh, further up um, the North American plate um, meeting the South American and the African plate. And then even further up um, the Eurasian plate, the North American plate and the African plate. And here... In Iceland, it's one of the very, very few places in the world where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or a Mid-Oceanic Ridge um, breaches through the surface of the ocean. And just by volcanic activity, actually creates a landform that emerges out of the ocean. And that's not only due to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So the, the plates here are moving apart, or basically the Eurasian plate is kind of static and the one that's moving apart is the North American plate. But... Only that movement wouldn't be enough for um, for creating enough new crust to form Iceland. And the other factor is that we have a mantle plume under Iceland, a geological hotspot similar to what we have in Hawaii. And that hotspot is one of the strongest, if not the strongest geological hotspots in the world. And that's emerging over one third of all... Um, released magma in the past 10,000 years on this planet. Wow. And if you see this tiny little island, it's just incredible to understand. But what you need to, to um, imagine is that Iceland sits on a socket that goes down to three, 4,000 meters. So it's actually just really like a big socket 
um, reaching down from the from the abyss of the Atlantic Ocean um, through the surface and then reaches heights above 2,000 meters. So there, there is actually quite something um, going on here. And those two factors together, they are the reason why we have a very, very active volcanism. And I think there is no other place in the world where you have so many volcanoes, active volcanoes, um, line up um, than in and Iceland. And you can really see those plates. I mean, this is the this is the amazing thing. You can drive to a to a place where you can like walk over a bridge, and then you're in Europe, and you walk over the bridge, and you're on the American plate. So it's really like this big, big uh, crevice that goes um, through the island. You can really see that. You can experience it with your own eyes. So I have to bust a myth here. You're not walking from North America to, ah, uh, to too bad. To Europa I was there. so hoping I had done that. <laughs> ah, I fell for so the you tourist look at trap. The, <laughs> when you look at the map there, um, so basically what you have, the big um, triangle on the left side from the West Fjords down to Reykjanes um, yeah. and, and that, that's the, the North American plate. And then you have the eastern part of the country going down to almost the um, around the area of Eyjafjallajökull um, on the south coast. That's the Eurasian plate. And everything in between is kind of new formed crust. Ah. So we, we it, it's not really the, where they build the bridge. You're not walking from one continent to the other. You basically walk from um, one or f from the edge of the North American plate to one break off part. So okay. you have to. Imagine that a little bit like um, like a cheesecake, and two kids are no, just no, it's, pulling, it's like, pulling that it's away. It's like a sixty eight. Things are breaking off of the iceberg, and here <laughs> things are breaking off of the of the plate. Yeah, but it, it's it's a little bit. So the and iceberg is, is 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 more dynamic. You have yes, um, the, the icebergs, which then are detached, so they are floating away. But if you have that cheesecake picture, if you pull it. You have this big mashy part in the middle, and that's pretty much what happens here because the crusts are still connected, even though they're moving apart. There's a lot of tension, and that releases over time through earthquakes, and then uh, cracks are um, created in the crust. And those cracks are actually where they build the bridge. It's not that this is like the other side of the continent. It's just it's it's another layer from the uh, from the same border of the of the crust does that make sense yes it does so so i'm um, i'm deeply disappointed now but <laughs> is is there is there any place on iceland where you can legitimately say no. i'm taking a step left and right and this is the the one plate and this is the other or is it is it more meshed together that's a that's a very human concept, and the problem is that geology doesn't work like that. So it works on a is, different scale. I know. Exactly, there is no clear end and no clear beginning of those plates. That's yes. really uh, you have a you have a big transition zone. So um, that's one of the reasons why, for a very long time, there was this uh, saying from tour guides: when you stand in in Thingvellir, um on top of that cliff, what we've just seen on the picture, and you. Just look down into the valley. Up here is North America. Down in the valley is Europe. That's just simply not true. It's a huge transition zone. I and particular fell victim to a massive lie, <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> and particularly in Thingvedli, you have this rift valley, which is um, certainly one of the areas where you clearly can see how new um, new cross has formed. It's not that you look down to, to the European plate. It's not the easiest that. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> but that fact, actually, with the uh, with a hot spot and the Mid Atlantic Ridge coming together, you can see how those volcanoes are just aligned along the rift zone of the Mid Atlantic Ridge. And we have this uh, map of uh, active volcanoes in Iceland, and it's a little bit difficult without the underlying map. But you actually can see that we have two um, main. Um, zones where we or volcanic zones where, where they are aligned one is the western zone which goes from the Reykjanes Peninsula all the way up to Langjökull to the second largest uh, glacier and then it takes a sharp turn to the east to Hofsjökull all the way up to the north then and the other one is starting around the Westman Islands much further to the east it goes down through Eyjafjallajökull and Katla um, through Hekla all the way to Vatnajökull and then it merges with the western rift zone, uh, volcanic zone, and just goes all the way up to it's, the north. This map um, that we're looking at right now, it's easy to see how they line up, how they go yes. along those lines. 
And this is a, a certain um, special feature in Iceland. So when we usually, um, non-geologists, when we talk about volcanoes, we have this perfectly cone-shaped uh, mountain uh, in mind that on its top has a crater and it's just having beautiful lava fountains coming out of it. In Iceland, it's slightly different. When we talk about volcanoes, we rather talk about volcanic fissures. And those volcanic fissures are aligned along the rift zone. And um, the big picture you can see here how the, the volcanoes are aligned along the volcanic zones, along the um, rift zone between the tectonic plates. But additionally, those are just like the main volcanoes, the, the, the central volcanoes in those fissure systems. Because in fact, in a fissure which can stretch up to 190 kilometers in length, technically the ground can just open everywhere along the fissure and just eject lava. That's actually what's happening right now in the Reykjanes Peninsula. And then it creates a new crater, a new cone, a new volcano, if you like, which is not a volcano in its own right because it doesn't really have its own magma chamber, but it's fed from the same magma source as the entire fissure. And that's something that's very, very special, sometimes a bit confusing, but it makes things so active, so lively in Iceland. It's a really, really interesting development there. So what actually happened now is on the 19th of March, after a period of almost a year where seismic activity has just built up and in the end came up with 50,000 earthquakes in just a month, we have had the start of an eruption. And it just happened that um, uh, that was just spotted on a webcam, um, which was just focused largely on the area from, um, from close to the airport. And then the uh, Coast Guard just um, sent a, an airplane and they took the first picture and the first video of the uh, of the eruption. And it was immediately clear it's not an explosive eruption, it's just effusive, it's just ejecting um, amounts of lava and um, gases. So very, very quickly the authorities figured it's not really a harmful um, eruption. So the rescue team from uh, Grindavik, Thorpe, they started to to mark trails to actually channel tourists going to the eruption site to mm. provide some sort of safety. And just to give you a quick figure, in the first week of that eruption, roughly 19,000 people visited the eruption site. <laughs> and 19, most, of them, most of them Icelanders, I would think? Almost entirely Icelanders, because there basically is no real tourism. It just starts now through the eruption <laughs> that people are coming back into the country, <laughs> and the country opened up the um, the the, uh, yeah, the the immigration, if you like, um, through people who have received vaccines. You don't have any trouble to enter the country if you're vaccinated, and if you can um, provide two negative PCR tests, you can. Um, enter the country as well without any problems. Other uh -huh. than that, you have to go through the obligatory um, quarantine. But even though a lot of people are taking the quarantine time and just they're just so keen to see that eruption, they stay in a hotel for a week and then they go out and... Which is um, not cheap in Iceland, I have to say. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, However, um, there's, a, there's a new regulation that the state... Um, um, has regulated how high the um, room is supposed to be for quarantine people. And it's about 80 euros a night, which is the cap. They're not allowed to charge more um, okay. right now. So just for you to keep in mind, if you're traveling as a couple, it's a room you can share, and it's just per room, it's not per people. Um, if you come alone, it's the same price. If you come with a four-people family and you just want to spend in, uh, the time in one room, it still is the same price. <laughs> so it's just something to keep in the back of the mind. Um, Iceland has reacted on that. Okay. So uh, they have mapped out routes where people can safely walk, the tourists can walk. Um, I think it's time to have a look at the at the 3D model that you uh, sent us because I find this really fascinating. So there's um, it is. Iceland 360 VR. It's an amazing website with a lot of 360 stuff built on, I believe, drone it's, footage and photos, yeah. aerial photos and things. It's it's a friend of mine who is like a, a, a wizard in so many things. He started with uh, Northern Light Photography when he uh, had insomnia and just uh, couldn't sleep and just went out and uh, explored <laughs> the countryside. 
And then he went into the 360 virtual, uh, virtual reality stuff. And Snorri is a perfectionist. He's just really, um, in, in profession, he's an architect, but he really digs into stuff. And he is doing that 360 uh, virtual reality stuff for years now and has built quite a library. So and he what, just we're, teamed what we're looking at in the video right now is not a photo. Let me let me move this around mm -hmm. while while you keep telling me about him. <laughs> um, so he teamed up um, with a with a fella who actually is into three D modeling, and he took the pictures Snorri has taken with his drone and turned that into a three D model of the eruption site on the I think it's the twenty seventh of uh, of March. So what we can see on that eruption site is very nicely the outline, the topography of the valley uh, where the fissure opened. You can see one, two, three, four, five uh, eruption vents. You have the, the, the main crater and then you have one, two, three, four um, next to it. And you awesomely can see the lava streams, how they actually fill the valley, how they follow the topography, how they... Um, also here at the bottom, they um, threatened to overrun um, a burial site for uh, a Viking prior to the Chris, um, uh, Christianity coming to, to the country. So this has actually already happened. So the lava has filled the valley so far that that burial site is just completely covered. But this is a, a momentum here really to... Um, yeah, to completely soak in, to, to explore a little bit the valley, to explore the lava streams. The resolution of the picture is just really incredible what they have done there. It's really, really awesome. It's a, a beautiful tool for classroom, I would say. Oh, look how far I can zoom in here. <laughs> right into the lava. Uh, I'm afraid and I'm going to melt. See, <laughs> what you can see on that is... You, you see largely black lava and then you have some um, glowing red streams um, around. And you can see that it's just a very thin uh, top layer that solidifies, that turns yeah. black very quickly after um, the lava reaches the surface. And underneath, the liquid stream is hotter than 900 degrees, so it's not solidifying yet. So it's constantly moving. It's a very thin flowing lava, so it travels very fast before it solidifies. So the, the layer on top kind of keeps it from freezing, right? It it's insulates it a bit, I guess. A bit, yes. Yes, a bit like that. But at the same time, uh, because it's not just like a solid concrete plate, the top layer also gets cracked just by the motion. It's a little bit like a river running underneath and having some sea ice on top of it. So the, the currents, the, the motion of the lava stream underneath is just breaking down the solidified um, surface. And that's the, the danger when people are going to the edge of the lava field and they just want to see how hot it actually is. It's super hot. But the, the, the imminent threat there is that underneath the sol um, solid appearing surface, the lava might still be liquid. And if the pressure is big enough, it just pushes forward. So the lava field is moving like a little caterpillar forward. And that happens in uh, in spasms, if you like. So it just immediately, suddenly just pushes further. And if you're in the wrong place, that's just your death sentence. Um, and is there, yeah, there's probably also a danger just breaking through that top layer if it's too thin. If you walk on it, certainly, yes. Yes. Okay. But I wouldn't so recommend that at all because even if it solidifies, the lava solidifies at around 900 degrees. So it looks solid. It looks cool to us. It's not cool. It's not cold at all. After Eyjafjallajökull, Jökull, we did hiking groups um, up onto that mountain pass where the whole Shabang started in 2010. And that was in 2016, 2017, if I remember correctly. And that's six, seven years after, and only the top layer was cold. It was cold enough, really. When you were sitting down, it was for me it was one of the most favorite lunch breaks. You hiked up to a thousand, thousand one hundred meters from sea uh, from sea level, and then you just made a uh, a break in one of those craters where the eruption of two thousand ten started. And people were just like, "Why the heck am I supposed to make lunch break here? It's just..." everything but nice it's super windy super chilly and then they sit down and they figure it's warm 
<laughs> from the bottom. And then you'd put your hand under the first layer of those loose uh, molten rocks, uh, not molten, solidified rocks, and you figure that the rock layer underneath is still really warm after seven years. So it gives you an idea how hot that is and how long it takes for the rocks to cool down to something we can actually handle as humans. It's just well, really it, an incredible feature. It's nice to heat up water and... Uh, make electricity and uh, all these kind of nice side effects there. Certainly, yes. And heat the That's sidewalks in Reykjavik. <laughs> Indeed, also do. <this. laughs> yeah. Um, there is a beautiful aerial photography from uh, from the eruption site, from uh, which is called Geltinga Dalir. Um, Dalir is the plural, so it's actually. Um, aerial picture is on a uh, Twitter has been taken by a photographer uh, from the Icelandic news has a really chosen a terrific angle here and it shows beautifully the valley and you can see the 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 completely black lava filling up that valley and one thing that is very interesting here is that a geologist calculated that this um Valley has kind of a tipping point. So at a certain point, it's like a bathtub. You reach a level where it overflows. And that level is not too much because um, the mountain pass on the right side of the picture is only 29 meters higher than the lowest part of the entire valley. And that's not much if you consider the amount of lava that's ejected. And we're talking about five to six cubic meters per second Oops. cubic meter is about a thousand liters so that's we're talking about five to six thousand liters per second so scientists calculated the the entire volume the capacity of that valley before it overflows is 6.5 million cubic meters that means with the average flow rate of the uh, of that um, eruption site that was between 12 and 17 days into the eruption that that tipping point would have been reached. But what then happened is actually that a new fissure opened roughly a kilometer further north-northeast of the existing um, eruption site. And that happened in the afternoon. Shortly, I think it was 3.30, something around that. And people were up on the mountain plateaus to get a safe view from the distance and then just figured, oh, there is something new coming up. And you can see in the video we have here from Morgan Blythe, you can see how the earth really just ripped open. It looks like a wound. It really looks like a sausage you put on the barbecue. It just, uh, <laughs> it just exploded. Yeah. And it's 200 meter long fissures and the lava fountains are just ejecting and that's just amazing to see then you have this lava stream uh, following a very narrow ravine down into the neighboring valley Meradalir. and what we can see here is that the speed of flow of that lava stream is even faster and that's not only because of the slopes of that valley it's because that lava has a, a slightly different chemical um, consistency, or com uh, consistency, so it, it travels faster than the one from the other valley. And you can look all the way down into the valley, how it then just like a, a river delta just spreads out. It's just terrific to see. So the overflow does not happen now through the initial eruption, but the new fissure that opened. And um, because the fissure opened, authorities um, just completely... Uh, closed the site of the first um, eruption and evacuated everyone. Helicopters from the Coast Guard have been um, taken in because what um, geologists figured um, very early into the eruption, and that's another picture we see right now, is that the area between the mountain Kailir and the current eruption site around Fagradarsfjall is supposed to be a dike in the... Um, in the crust, so basically a lot of hollow spaces where the magma just intrudes, and that goes along a fissure line, and that fissure line is actually um, along that um, rift zone between the continents. And you can see that 
all of the activity that has been uh, recorded at the moment is along that fissure. So we have the lineup of those five craters at the initial um, eruption site all perfectly on one line. And on that map we see on the, um, on, on the video, we have some yellow marked spots. That's cracks a geologist um, identified very, very early into the eruption and they thought that might uh, going to be the next opening. However, the blue line um, at the very north end of that yellow line, that's where the second um, fissure actually opened eventually. And then just one day later, for, uh, in the night from I think it was from Tuesday to Wednesday, uh, it was the night to yesterday, a third fissure opened between the second and the first one. So now, and that's um, another, um, I think it's on the website from, from Wederstorven, from, from the uh, meteorological office. They have a beautiful um, picture of, or a map of um, how th those, exactly here, the, the purple one, how those uh, sites are lined up, where the lava is actually flowing. And now they have confirmed that all three um, fissures are interconnected to so all the the fissures have created a lava field that is in um by now interconnected so we have a continuous lava field from the initial eruption site to the th uh, the second fissure in the north and that might not even be the end it might even travel further north but for now the activity has traveled to the second and the third um fissure and in the initial eruption site, the activity has um, calmed down a bit. So now it's just really a question, how long is this going on? And that's a, a question a lot of geologists are very, very careful to answer about. The, the, the answers range from can end in, in, in days uh, to it can go on for decades. Well, for decades, if it doesn't spread out too far, that would be good for tourism, I think. Um, but if it continues spreading out, then I don't know. Is it? Is there any danger of it encroaching on places that are um, that should that, that that it shouldn't encroach on? So the the type of the eruption right now is all in all a very effusive eruption. So the biggest danger we have is the emission mm. of gases. Okay. If that continues to be like that, it's um, it's kind of a controlled setting. If it goes into another valley, then we still have the chance of having a controlled setup where we can guide tourists to certain safe areas to watch um, the eruption site uh, from close by. But the thing with volcanoes is there's always a level of uncertainty in. You never really know if um, there is an interaction, for example, with groundwater, which then would turn into an explosive eruption because water and magma, that's not really a good combination. Uh, it turns into uh, a water vapor that just bursts um, into a million small pieces. Those kind of ex explosive eruptions are very unpredictable. So that's something you don't want to be close. Yeah. So the level of uncertainty is why authorities generally are rather careful of making a uh, volcanic eruption site accessible for the public. But here, however, at the moment, the um, eruption site, since the second fissure opened, is closed anyhow. And um, the locals hope that certain areas uh, will be opened again. And um, you might be even able to um, go up on neighboring um, plateaus, mountain plateaus, and just have a look from there. So looking at one of the live video streams from there, there are a couple now. It's not just one. Um, <laughs> That's true. It, it, it's interesting how, how not spectacular it looks during the daytime. You can see some snow uh, in the air. There's a bit of smoke moving and... Uh, um, it, it kind of is dis deceivingly benign looking, right? Yeah, well, certainly the, the the picture we see right now, um, the, the live feed from Geltinger Dahlia, that's the initial eruption site where the activity has gone down quite a lot. But you see also from the left side coming in the lava stream, that's from the third fissure that just opened um, second last night. Yeah. Um, the... Activity is best visible at this stadium during night when you actually see the glowing red uh, lava coming out there. 
Um, you still see in the uh, main crypto, you see uh, a tiny little fountain. It's not too big, but of course it is like you have this big reservoir of, of magma in the dike underneath, and you have now a number of vents. So the initial power of that eruption has just diverted into the other eruption sites. And now we see the um, the second com uh, official camera from uh, the Icelandic National Television from uh, Meradalia. And you can see how much bigger that um, field has grown uh, when it uh, flew into it's, the river. It's the black just... stuff that we see here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've seen the, uh, the, the picture of the... Um, lava flowing into the valley just a few minutes ago. And you can just compare. It's just significantly larger just um, by one day. But also here, you don't really see much activity because we are very, very far away. We are on the opposite side of the valley, far away from the actual um, fissure zone. One of the cameras from the newspaper Morgenblatt, for example, was... Um, situated where the third fissure opened so actually the lava from the third fissure <laughs> has just completely destroyed that camera it's gone okay it's gone yeah <laughs> and a number so, of, of people have just put up those live streams now so if you just um google live stream iceland uh you will find numerous yes. um set up cameras there okay so one last thing that i need from you is um Tell us again, or teach me how to pronounce it, because I have no idea about Icelandic pronunciation. <laughs> That's very difficult because there is no real name for it yet. So, but, it, um, but it's it's the site, right? It's this Gelding something site that is yeah. Well, so I've it, I've seen it named the Icelandic volcano, but uh, <laughs> there are more than one. <laughs> That's the easiest. <laughs> um, it's Gelding Adalir. That's uh, Gelding almost pronounced Gelding Adalir. Yeah, it's almost pronounced as it's written. And Gelding is like um, a castrated horse or a castrated animal in general. And it's thought that this valley has been used for castrated rams to, to gather them, to keep them together uh -huh. um, over, over summer. Interesting um, name. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about that. And then you have uh, the neighboring valley, uh, Meradalir which is also not too difficult. Um, you, you you have a certain pronunciation of the R. That's just more rolled in Icelandic language than you have it in English or in German. So that's for us a difficulty. Um, geologists are talking about um, Geldinger Dahl's Gos, which basically means the Geldinger Dahl... If you like. Can, and can, I've seen can you repeat also the last 10 seconds? Because you were, you were frozen here for a second. Yeah, okay. Um, the geologist has named that Gelding Adars Gorse, which means the Gelding Valley uh, fires, um, if you would Gelding uh, translate Adars that. Do dos? Gelding Adars Gorse. Gelding Adars Gorse. Yes. Okay. And, <laughs> and you can also just say Reykjanes fires. I've seen uh, a number of people referring to the eruption already as the Reykjanes fires, which is kind of what what uh, what volcanologists volcanologists um, expect that this whole episode is just the start of a longer period of volcanic activity in the area and we have seen something similar in the um, late 70s early 80s up in the north when we had the so-called Krapla fires or even earlier um, uh, around Lake Mivatn when there were the Mivatn fires so there have been periods of like about 10 years and in those 10 years you had like constant eruptions then you had a very brief um pause and then the eruption went uh went on so something like this is expected here and the term reykjanes fires will possibly be the one that's going to be established okay well thank you so much for bringing us all this um amazing stuff Truly <laughs> amazing. Yeah, blows blows me away. I mean, just having stood next to a volcano once is, was, was mind-blowing seeing this. So you can, of course, find us at Curiously Polar on the social media. We are at CuriouslyPolar.com with all the previous episodes. There is uh, our YouTube channel, um, which is all linked in the show notes. And I think um, yeah, we'll say goodbye. Until next time, everyone, take care and uh, don't get too close to volcanoes. Okay,